Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching vSphere Network Security Considerations. In this lesson, we're going to talk all about security. We're going to talk about the considerations, how virtual networking is different, common deployment scenarios when you have different trust zones, all sorts of stuff. So we're going to start with security considerations with virtual networking, where we talk about you know what is different between virtual networking and regular networking. Then we'll talk about you know things specific things like firewall ports, vSphere, what's kind of required for communication amongst the different components. Network configuration for different trust zones is something that I, I get asked about a lot. So you may have like a DMZ network or a network that's under you know in scope for PCI compliance, things like that. And how do you architect that? And you know, do you use mixed clusters, separate clusters, all sorts of stuff? So we'll talk about that. Common security mistakes and, and considerations, these are just normal best practices and often things that I see people do that I think are, you know, you could do a little better. Protecting management and other traffic, so we'll talk a little bit about why you need to protect things like vCenter, but also other things like vMotion and fault tolerance. Then a tour of the vShield suite. We're not going to go super deep on the vShield suite, but I want you to understand what makes up the suite, the components, what their uses are, and how they're deployed. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about third-party tools, which are starting to explode. We're seeing a lot of growth in security around VMware and virtual environments. Sounds good. So let's go ahead and let's get started. Security considerations. Well, while virtual switches are software instead of hardware, they're still pretty much actual switches. You know, So some of the things that can be done to exploit physical switches can be exploited on virtual switches. But you know, there's other things that make them more secure. It's harder to VLAN hop, meaning you can't just easily plug in. You know, with VLAN hopping is I can plug into a port on a switch that has multiple VLANs trunk and then start, you know, capturing data, looking at the communications or forging the VLAN tagging on frames and try to get into VLANs I'm not supposed to be. With these, you know, if I give you a VM and I assign your VNIC on your VM to a certain port group, you as the user in the VM can't do anything about it. And even if you gain full access to that VM, you can't just easily change to a different port group or look at other traffic for other VMs. They also, these virtual switches don't run spanning tree. So they're a lot less likely to have other issues or be able to have a denial of service attack. Speaking of denial of service attacks, they don't really need to learn MAC addresses. A normal switch has a table of the MAC addresses that it knows. If you fill up that table and overrun it, they start kind of, you know, sending out the frames to all ports because they're not sure where a device lives. So it's kind of like when a Mac isn't in that table already. The first time something tries to communicate, the switch sends it out all available ports and waits for a response to kind of fill in the Mac table. V switches don't learn Mac addresses. They don't have to. They know which VMs live on the host and what their Mac addresses are. So they don't need to go learn everything that they see. If they see a frame, Destined for a MAC address and it's not one of their VMs, they know it's pretty much outside and they can send it up to the physical environment. So it makes things much simpler. There's no reasonable limitation on the number of ports like a normal switch. A 48 port switch has 48 ports. A big chassis switch may have hundreds of ports, but there's still a limit. With things like the distributed switch in VMware, we can do, you know, a thousand or several thousand, you know, these virtual ports on a single host. We can do 30,000 in a vCenter instance. So there's a huge number and there's not really a reasonable limitation. And we also don't have to worry about trunking or channeling connections together for these virtual switches. And it's just no overhead for that. So in a lot of ways they are switches, but in some ways they're better than physical switches. Along with these advantages, virtual switches are usually not vulnerable to many common attacks. So MAC flooding. I just talked about this where an attacker can flood a switch with a lot of MAC addresses causing it to what we call fail open, meaning it's going to start sending data through to all the ports. That's not going to happen with a virtual switch. It doesn't keep that table. VLAN tag attack where an attacker forges VLAN tags in an attempt to gain access to other networks. Again, if I give you access to a VM, full on, full admin access, but I assign your VNIC to a specific port group, you don't have access to change that. And if you try to you know, change VLAN tags, the vSwitch is going to drop it. It sees that it's invalid. Double tags is another one where an attacker attempts to put a second tag on a frame. Again, the vSwitch is going to see that and drop it. Multicast frame attack, similar to MAC flooding, but they're using it with multicast frames. Again, vSwitches are going to see that. 
and spanning tree attacks. Well, there's no way to attack spanning tree in a V-switch. They don't run spanning tree. So if you forge a BPDU packet or frame, BPDU frame, that tries to do something, you know, with a root bridge, they're just going to look at you with a funny look because, you know, V-switches don't speak spanning tree, so those frames mean absolutely nothing to them. So again, they're kind of like physical switches, but simpler and not susceptible to as many types of attacks. Firewall ports. So if you're going to firewall communications between, say, vCenter and your vSphere host, which is not that uncommon, it's, it's fairly common to keep management uh, devices or servers or applications in their own firewalled area. So it's not that uncommon. And so you're going to need to be aware of all those ports that you need to open for communication. And this list varies. It varies. Are you using Update Manager? What version of vSphere? What other features are you using? Are you using something like vChargeback or vCloud Director? It's a huge list. If I sat here and went through this list in slides, you would, you would go crazy and wonder what was wrong with me. So VMware keeps an updated KB article. It's 101.2382. If you go look that article up, it's always current with the ports that you need to open for firewalls between the different components. It can get a little messy. Like I said, there's a lot of ports, but it's not too bad. I mean, it just depends on, you know, if things need to talk to the vSphere host or they just talk to vCenter or they just talk to the database server, you know, just keep that in mind. You probably don't need to open all those ports across the firewalls. Just look at what it needs to communicate with that specific component. And then there's the question of configuring the virtual network for different trust zones. And the, you know, the exact configuration you use depends on the type of network switch. So standard V switches are a little different than, say, the vSphere distributed switch. And it's really all about how you configure your physical uplinks. Are you sharing uplinks using VLANs? Are you separating traffic on different uplinks? And also remember to separate your management traffic, and that's a pretty big deal. And I'll show you examples on both type of VMware vSphere switches, the standard vSwitch and the vSphere distributed switch, the VDS. So before we dive into specifics, let's talk a bit about the design. So a common question I get is how do we handle different trust zones? And you know, with a physical server, there's some things we wouldn't do. Like if I had a single physical server with two NICs, would I put one NIC into the DMZ and one into production? Well, not likely because I'm bypassing firewalls and I'm setting up a great way for an attacker to get into the DMZ, exploit the host, and then I've got a path into production. So why don't we just replicate how we do it in the physical world where we have dedicated host in the DMZ and dedicated host in production or dedicated host to a PCI environment. The reason is you have greatly lower consolidation ratios and you can't take advantage of a lot of the other benefits. You know, if I have these split clusters, I have extra hardware for N plus one failover. I don't have these efficiencies of scales of larger clusters for DRS to do better balancing, things like that. So it's in a lot of cases, we want to try to do these mixed clusters to take advantage of these features. And let's look at some examples. So assume a company has different trust zones. Some examples, again, production, DMZ, PCI, maybe medical records for HIPAA, things like that. And there are usually three options for separating these out. There's what we call the partially collapsed, but with separate physical trust zones. There's partially collapsed with a virtual separation. And then there's the fully collapse. And I'm going to show you each of these in a minute with some diagrams so you don't have to sit there and try to figure out what the differences are. The one that you use depends on your security policy, your organization, legal, regulatory compliance. In a lot of cases, just the amount of risk that maybe a security team or CISO thinks there are with some of these options. You know, they may not trust the hypervisor to truly segment VMs. So they may say, you know what, I don't trust it. We're going to do these things as separate clusters or something like that. Very common for that to be this first step into this, and then later they start collapsing things together. But again, it just depends on your organization. So here's partially collapsed with separate physical trust zones. And what do we mean by this is, let me get my pointer, we got vCenter here on a management network, firewalled from production. We got internet with a firewall here. So we've got a web server cluster an application cluster, and a database cluster. And between these, we have physical firewalls. That's what physical trust zones mean. So you have a physical you know, Cisco ASA or you know, something like that between each of your environments. You know, The good thing is it's pretty close to what we do with physical. People kind of trust it. It works well. The bad thing is we're splitting up all these different environments. We don't get those efficiencies of scale. 
Pros and cons, very similar to physical, but lower consolidation. The big thing is there's less chance of a misconfiguration. That's the number one usual worry or risk when we're looking at doing a collapsed uh, environment. You know, a simple misclick can make a VM be in the DMZ or in the wrong network when with a physical or a split cluster like this, you'd have to move that VM to the other cluster. You have to really think about making that mistake. Less consolidation of duties, um, you know, operational costs are higher because we usually have people managing those different environments, you know, more people, more equipment, things like that. Support knowledge is less affected because, again, we're not really worrying about mixing different workloads and things like that, but you also get less efficient use of features such as vMotion, DRS, and HA. Partially collapsed with separate virtual trust zones. So this is a little bit different. What we've got here again is vCenter Management Network, firewalled from production, but we have a single vSphere host or cluster. Usually it's a cluster. Within this host or cluster, we have different physical NICs connected to different physical networks separated by firewalls. So we've collapsed the VMs and the servers, but communication between the different types or the different environments goes through physical security appliances. And Again, this is one of those things where we start to collapse things, but we still use usually existing controls for managing our security. And this is usually in or an often a happy medium between the different options. So again, just remember, we mix things in a cluster or host. We dedicate NICs for the different types of servers. You may have a vSwitch for database servers with some NICs connected to this switch, a vSwitch with NICs for the application, and a vSwitch with NICs for the web servers. But to get from one to the other, you got to go through physical firewalls. Pros and cons, you know, greater use of utilization of resources. We're mixing things in a cluster, we get those efficiencies. But the configuration is more complex. We have things kind of munched together, and so you could accidentally take a database VM and attach it to the web server vSwitch, and all of a sudden it's out front, publicly facing. You can take better advantage of features such as DRS and HA, but again, misconfiguration. Reduced number of hosts means less costs, but it requires tighter change control and configuration management. You really want to have tighter change control here. You don't want to make those mistakes. You're going to hear me harp on that a number of times. And it's less operational cost due to fewer hosts. But again, I suggest regular audits for configuration compliance to make sure no mistakes were made. And then we have the fully collapsed trust zone. So here, we have, you know, VMware vCenter again, management network, firewall from production, that doesn't usually change. But we have our different configurations here, and we're using things like virtual firewalls for this separation. So we're not really doing anything with physical, we're doing them with virtual. And it just saves connections, it makes the configuration, to me, simpler, but to someone who's used to physical, you know, firewalls and controls, it might actually look more complex. But the thing to keep in mind is for the web server to talk to the application server, it goes web server into my internal vSwitch to the firewall over here to this vSwitch for the app servers. That's great. When the app servers want to talk to database, back over here up to the firewall over to the database servers. And we'll have rules in the firewall so the web server can't ever talk to the database server. So everything is truly collapsed. And you're, you know, if you heard me talk about misconfiguration a minute ago, just wait to the next slide. So you have complete utilization of all resources, no real silos, but the greatest complexity of any configuration. Cheapest option normally due to the collapsed, total collapse of the infrastructure, but the highest risk of that misconfiguration. You know, now I can put things in a wrong vSwitch, now I can misconfigure that virtual firewall, there's just more things that can go wrong. The entire environment managed from a single place, uh, the virtual appliance is used for security could be misconfigured and a lot of times those you know the support staff isn't used to handling those and it's also much more complex configuration all your networking your IPs your routing those are all being handled by virtual devices which again might be new to the network or security teams and you're going to get pushback so rarely do people jump in feet first with this option usually this is the one that they kind of eventually roll to but it, you know, I talked about it on the last one, but you want to make sure you have really good change control and change management here. You don't want to just go off and be able to make, you know, ad hoc changes without any oversight. And again, I would be auditing this on a regular basis.
Now for some top 10 common mistakes and recommendations, you know, some things to keep in mind when securing virtual networking. First of all, keep things simple. The more complex, the more chance of a misconfiguration. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of simplicity. Leonardo da Vinci had a great quote that I love. It's, you know, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And I love that quote because it really kind of defines how I do my, a lot of my environment data center designs. You want it to be elegant and you want it to be simple. If things get overly complex, you know, you have problems or if someone needs to come behind you to audit or change or take over or support because you're on vacation, you don't want things to be too complex. They're going to do something, misconfigure, and then you're going to get drug right back into it. Make sure that your vSphere port group names are correct and descriptive. I see this a lot. You know, if you don't have really descriptive names, it again increases the chance of a problem. I see people that, you know, they just, they don't, they'll put like, you know, the port group name will be servers. And then when they want to do something else, it'll be servers too, or something like that. I'm usually a fan of a purpose and the VLAN number within the name of the port group. So if you want to do it, do DMZ and in parentheses put VLAN 75. Something like that that's very descriptive. Don't do duplicate port groups unless there's a specific reason. You'll see my lab, I do this. Management is VLAN 5. And VM, or virtual machine traffic, is also VLAN 5. But that's a lab. You know, I don't, want to, I don't like to see that in production, except in cases where, you know, you're doing a migration and you're going to move, you know, management to a different VLAN, so it makes more sense to, to split out the port group so you can change it later. But I see it a lot. I see multiple server port groups all in the same VLAN with different names. It just, it makes problems. If you haven't already, implement VLANs. I still see flat networks out there. And again, as you want to start, you know, splitting things out or putting security controls in place, it makes a lot of sense to split out your network, use and implement VLANs. And I, I hit on this again in the VLAN lesson. Only trunk the VLANs you need. I hit on this in the VLAN lesson as well. If I connect my vSphere host to the network and I'm only caring about, you know, four VLANs on that vSphere host, that's all I'm going to connect into, don't trunk all the VLANs down. This is just good general networking practice for a number of reasons. You want to limit the you know, problem domain or a fault domain to only hosts and switches that need to be on certain VLANs. But you also want to do it for security reasons. I don't want VLANs extended where they don't need to be in case an attacker should try to get access. Secure those physical uplink switches. We spend a lot of time talking about vSwitches because they're this kind of black box and they're a little scary. And then people forget about those physical switches that kind of give you the keys to the kingdom. If I've got access to those and I can get to traffic those, I just watch all the traffic going in and out of your vSphere host. You know, forget attacking the vSwitch. I'll just do that. Make sure you know the security requirements of your VMs and your applications. You know, don't be mixing things if you don't understand what the security requirements are, whether it's regulatory, whether it's policy, or your legal and regulatory requirements like I have on number eight. You know, understand that if it really becomes important around PCI and HIPAA, because if you start mixing in, say, PCI, in scope PCI VMs with other things, all of a sudden those things can become in scope because they're touching. Keep that in mind when you start putting down your security requirements and your, and your controls. Understand how the layered protection defenses work amongst the vSphere products, and we'll talk about the vShield suite later in this lesson. There's a lot of layers here, plus third-party products, plus existing physical products. It can be a bit overwhelming. Just stand back, create your design, look at what your requirements are, what your goals are, and build around that. And then finally, audit your configuration and settings regularly. Do this at least once a year, preferably once a quarter. Make sure these things are the same. There are some great you know, PowerCLI and PowerShell scripts out there that will do daily reports and let you know if some things on the networking changed or configuration or security has changed. I recommend you go look for those and use them. They're useful and they'll save you trouble, but also again go back through and audit those configurations. There are some settings you can adjust on the on the vSphere V switches. It supplies both the standard V switch and the distributed V switch. The configuration items are the same. Promiscuous mode, MAC address changes, and forge transmits. So you don't need to add anything else for these these items here. Here's a description. They're pretty simple. Promiscuous mode just means to allow a VM to see traffic from other VMs. The answer to this may be yes if you're using it to run a packet sniffer or traffic analyzer. Rest of the time you need to leave it as reject. Now, 
I'll talk about the distributed switch and its port mirroring capability in the troubleshooting lesson later in the course. If you're going to use that, you can always leave this to reject. It does not use this promiscuous mode setting. It doesn't need it for that. So you can just leave that. But if you're doing packet sniffing on a standard V switch, you may need to enable this for the port group that you're sniffing traffic amongst. MAC address changes. This allows a VM to change its MAC address. Normally that MAC address is stored in the VMX file for the configuration of the VM, VM boots, and we'll stop it from changing its MAC address to try to impersonate something else. But, as with all things, there are exceptions. Load balancers and clustering, mainly Microsoft load balancing and clustering, uh, need this to be set to accept because they will do things like share a virtual MAC address amongst devices and it's going to appear that that MAC comes from that VM if this is set for reject, it's going to not let that happen, and it's going to break. So if you use those, accept. I normally recommend, if you're doing that, create a port group just for the clustering or load balancing devices, even if it is a duplicate of another one on the same VLAN. Set the settings for these here, but don't do that, say, server-wide with your other 300 virtual machines. Use specific port groups for that. Forge transmits. Allows a VM to send a frame with a different MAC than the one assigned. Again, this use cases are similar for those we just talked about, load balancers and clustering. You'll probably accept this to allow, and you're going to want or accept, and you're going to probably want to create a port group specifically for those VMs that need it. Again, don't do it for all the VMs. Same options are with the distributed switch. You know, nothing else to install. Uh, the main considerations are around availability, vCenter, and watching that so an attacker doesn't perform a denial of service attack against vCenter. I talk about the reliance on vCenter and what it does in the, the vSphere distributed switch in depth lesson, again later in the course. Just keep in mind that if vCenter is down, it can affect some operations on VMs, especially powering up new VMs. So you want to protect vCenter as a tier one infrastructure application. We go again, again, we go into that in more detail a little later in the lesson, but keep that in mind. So protect your management communications. This is something that a lot of people don't really think about. You know, why do we bother? Well, we don't want to have direct access to many uh, management interfaces. And not all traffic containing sensitive data is encrypted. And this is something that a lot of people don't think about. vMotion and FT are not encrypted. If we did that, it would put a great strain on our host. So as I throw a VM from one host to another, all those memory contents are going across unencrypted. Fault tolerance is doing the same thing. It's logging and shipping a lot of these changes of memory and CPU from one to another in real time unencrypted. So keep that in mind. You don't want to have someone have access to those things who could sniff the traffic and then all of a sudden be able to, you know, reconstruct data. This kind of goes back to the only trunk VLANs you need. You know, make sure that another server that you know, maybe another group belongs to doesn't have access to, say, the vMotion or FT VLANs where they'd then be able to start, you know, trying to capture data, impersonating MAC addresses, something like that. Uh, intercepting storage and making changes is another one. You know, NFS, iSCSI, things like that that run across IP networks, they're not encrypted. You know, someone could look at that and possibly make changes, so keep that in mind. Consider any VMs that are running management consoles, and it's a good idea to use dedicated management virtual NICs and VM NICs, physical NICs, for communication. So instead of, you know, just grouping those in with the regular VM traffic, you may want to dedicate specific NICs to those to a secured network, management network. VLANs are often used for network segmentation, but contrary to a lot of things that I see, they are not useful for security. Yes, if my device I plug into your switch plays nice and plays on the VLAN that he's supposed to be on, that's great. But if you trunk a bunch of VLANs to my device and I start hopping around and, you know, changing my VLAN number, that means I can do things. Also, if an attacker gets access to the wire, if there's 10 VLANs of traffic going across there, they can sniff all 10. You know, a VLAN is nothing but a little tag put in the header of an Ethernet frame. And so it doesn't do anything specific security-wise to stop someone from sniffing traffic. So just keep that in mind. And dedicated physical connections may be required for some environments. We call these specialized security limited functionality, SSLF environments. I put that acronym there in case you go decide to take some of the uh, VCAP courses, things like that. You'll see the acronym SSLF sometimes, and it's Specialized Security Limited Functionality. Think DMZ networks, PCI, HIPAA, stuff like that. Just networks where we have to lock them down more than we would, say, the internal production network. 
here's a diagram showing you know isolating management but sharing NIC. So basically we've got things on different VLANs. So yes, it is isolated to its own VLAN, but it's still going over shared NICs and shared infrastructure. So it's not really secure, it's just separated. The alternate to that is this, where we're using a dedicated NIC. So for these kind of, you know, traffic vMotion, NFS, iSCSI would be here, fault tolerance or management, we might want to use dedicated NICs and attach them to the right V switches or port groups, depending on what, which uh, type of switch you're using. And then we would keep this separate. Your VM traffic runs over here. Your more you know, sensitive traffic runs over dedicated NICs. Again, it's just a good idea to do that over dedicated connections if you're really concerned that someone may be able to sniff that traffic and pull out information. So with all that design consideration and talk, now it's time to look at a couple of different things for kind of implementing security controls. And a control is just a way that, you know, you take a policy and say, you're not allowed, this isn't allowed to talk to that. Okay, a control is that way that we enforce that policy. So v, the vShield suite is a set of, of different products. Some people will say, well, we installed vShield. Well, you really didn't. Well, I guess you could if you install all the components, but it's, it's not really well communicated from VMware and other partners on what exactly vShield is or does. So it is a suite of products. It's made up of four separate products that can be used together or individually and kind of creates a really good, secure, you know, a suite of packages here. So first you've got vShield Zones, which is your basic VM firewall. vShield Zones used to be pretty good back in the vSphere 441 days. With vSphere 5, VMware did something a little weird. They actually rolled functionality back. I'm not a fan of this. I'm actually complaining very loudly about it. I don't like what they've done. They basically did it because people were not moving up to the vShield app enhanced firewalling. They thought the zones was good enough. And so they rolled it back to what we call version 1 of zones, which is a more complicated configuration for networking and just not as good. But the long and short of it is, is that vShield zones is a basic VM firewall you can say this IP is or is not allowed to talk to that IP on these ports, source and destination and protocol type. It's what we call a five tuple firewall. Source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port and application or protocol, I'm sorry. That's your five different tuples and you can configure those and it's a VM firewall so if you enable it on all the hosts in your cluster then it automatically applies and you can just say this IP can't talk to that IP and it doesn't matter which host the VMs are on, that firewall enforces that policy within the cluster. You can then upgrade vShield zones to vShield app. Now zones comes with enterprise and enterprise plus licensing these days. It also used to come with advanced but advanced is now deprecated and so it's part of enterprise and plus. If you own enterprise or you own enterprise plus you have vShield zones licensing today. Most people I talk to don't know that. So I'll go and stand in front of a big VMware users group and I'll do my, you know, a security presentation and I'll say, okay, you know, how many people here are looking for virtual firewall? A bunch of people raise their hand. How many people here, you know, use vShield zones? A couple people raise their hand. How many people here have licenses for it? Same people raise their hand. Maybe a couple more who know. And then I'll say, you know, how many of you guys have Enterprise or Enterprise Plus? And everybody raise their hand. Well, you all have vShield zone licensing. Why aren't you using it now? And everybody's like, oh, I had no idea. Well, you have it. And what you can do is you can then do vShield app. App is an upgrade to zones. If you go and buy the vShield app licenses, it upgrades your zone. So it's not really two separate products. It's zones and then app is the upgrade. App is better. It, it does a few things. First of all, you can group your VMs. I can say these are my database VMs and these are my application server VMs. And app is allowed to talk to database on this port. What this does is it keeps you from having to do these individual access lists for every VM. And every time you bring up a new VM, I got to run these access lists again or something like that. You know, or doing it, you know, putting the application servers on one IP subnet and the database on another so I can do IP subnet access lists. But it allows you to group them. It also allows you to pull back a lot more monitoring and information. So you can pull back protocol information, statistics, throughputs, things like that, uh, which is very handy. As an option or an alternate to that, I talk about in the troubleshooting lesson, we, we can do NetFlow. If you have Enterprise Plus, use a distributed switch. You can pull a lot of information I think is better via NetFlow. But for firewalling, app is definitely better. It's just easier to manage. So again, if you have Enterprise or Enterprise Plus, you get zones, which is a basic five-tuple firewall. 
you can upgrade that to VShield App. Then we have VShield Edge. Edge is separation from multi-tenancy environments. And this, it does several things. If you've ever used or plan to use vCloud Director and have it do multi-tenancy where you can, you know, what we call fence networks amongst a group of VMs next to other groups and give or disable access or things like that, it uses vShield Edge. Edge provides a couple things. It will provide load balancing, VPN access, so I can have one environment, you know, fenced off with Edge, VPN to another environment, and they can talk. It does its DHCP server, so all the VMs within this Edge environment can DHCP IPs from the Edge appliance, and it does network address translation or NAT. So you can do private addressing inside this, you know, containerized group, and it will NAT it to an external IP. With vCloud Director, it does even more where I can have the same Mac, same IPs used in multiple environments, maybe a dev test environment where I want to have the same configuration across multiple different test sites. And vShield Edge allows us to do that and still be able to translate to the outside world. So very good multi-tenancy where we want to kind of fence off a network. And then there's vShield Endpoint. Endpoint provides endpoint protection with third-party products. So if you deploy Endpoint, you're not really getting anything today. You need to add something like Trend Micro's Deep Security, which does anti-malware protection. And the way it does it is it's kind of like if you use the, you know, uh, vStorage APIs for you know backup and things like that where you're actually plugging into the hypervisor level. You don't have to put agents for antivirus in every VM. You put an appliance virtual machine on each vSphere host, plugs into the hypervisor, watches traffic going to network and storage in real time, and will block it as needed. You have to have endpoint licensing for that and the third-party product. That's very popular in the VDI world. So these can be used together or individual, it's just up to you, but that's kind of the overview of the vShield suite. The suite is managed from the vShield Manager. vShield Manager is an appliance VM that you deploy, and it's uh, managed via web interface, or you can do it from, you know, it's a plug-in to vCenter, which in turn just puts the web interface in vCenter, but it's very simple. You deploy it, you give it an IP, and you log into it. You manage all the different vShield applications from here, Endpoint, Edge, Zones, and App. So you deploy it from an OVA file, this you know, containerized standard OVA file. You enter some basic information in the, in the CLI when it comes up, and the rest is done via web interface. And I'll show you a demo of that here in just a minute. So vShield Zones, as we said, you know, provides basic stateful firewall functionality, and it's included with Enterprise and Enterprise Plus. It's a standard five-tuple firewall rule set. So source port, source address, destination port, destination address, and protocol. And you can filter on both layer two and layer three. Layer two is things like ARP. Layer three is pretty much any kind of IP configuration that you want to do. But it does allow you to do some layer two firewalling. All traffic in and out of protective VM will pass through a vShield zone agent. And so each vSphere host will have an agent virtual machine installed and the kernel modules loaded. So the agent VM uses VMSafe for hypervisor integration. Well, it used to. That's one of the things that they changed when they rolled it back in 5. I uh, believe 5 uses the old network pass-through config of the original version. Again, if you update to app, vShield app, it'll use VMSafe for better hypervisor integration. It just makes things simpler. Each protected VM will have a new config item added to its VMX file. Remember, the VMX file is the configuration file stored on disk with the VM's other files. And it adds a filter line, or actually two lines here. You got the parameter line and the name line. And, and what's really neat is vCenter adds these lines and removes them as needed. So if you have a cluster and you haven't enabled zones on all the hosts, and you vMotion a VM from an unprotected host to a protected host, it'll add the appropriate lines. When you vMotion off of the protected host to an unprotected host, vCenter will remove those lines. So, you know, just one thing to keep in mind is if something ever happens and you ever rebuild a host that had vShield installed, now it doesn't, and you get errors when you try to boot VMs, you may need to manually remove those lines. I've actually run into that once or twice. It's usually in a very, you know, rebuild type situation where something went wrong on a host, and then we had to fix this. Uh, normal operation, it's not a big deal. So configuration is pretty simple. Got a kind of a shot of the GUI right there. Just understand there's a certain order of operation. 
So there's also certain places that you configure rules. Like at the data center level, we can configure high and low precedence rules. We can configure rules at the cluster level. You can create rules at the port group level. And so, you know, data center high is the first one evaluated, then cluster, then data center low, then secure port, and then default. So you got to understand that. Again, if you're at a cluster level, you can't make changes to data center high rules. You have to be at the data center org level. And, you know, just understand that there's a specific order here, and that'll make configuration easier. And one more thing is, you know, it's not like you're looking at one place in the GUI and you only see data center high, and another place you only see data center low. When I click on something, it's going to show me the full rule set. So you'll see it, you just won't be able to make changes to it from each location. App, as we talked about, is not a separate product. It enhances zones. So you can group VMs together, apply ACLs between those groups instead of doing each VM, and you also get that in-depth traffic flow. You know, you can look at the protocols, the amount of traffic, things like that, and it also uses VM-safe hypervisor integration. Edge is your multi-tenancy. It containerizes a network, provides common services, DHCP, VPN, NAT, and load balancing. Multi-tenancy is a good use case. Site-to-site -site VPNs amongst divisions are another uh, use case. And if you use vCloud Director, it absolutely uses vShield Edge for its network fencing. So then you put them all together. You know, it can be a little bit confusing and it can seem like it overlaps, but it really doesn't. Just remember security is about layers, defense in depth, as we say. So parameter is vShield Edge for NAT and VPN. Application protection, use vShield App, preferably over Zone. And for VM protection, we use vShield Endpoint to allow for easy anti-malware protection. And so not all environments will need all pieces. You know, vShield Edge is probably the most optional. I see a lot of people now using zones and app. We have a lot of VDI deployments using endpoint with something like Trend Micro's deep security so that they're not running agents in every VDI client VM. Edge is picking up as people deploy vCloud Director, but as a standalone, uh, not real common in most environments. You know, service providers, sure. Big, large organizations where they have different groups or different organizations, you know, sub-organizations that they want to kind of keep as different tenants, sure, but as far as most, you know, commercial and low enterprise type uh, environments, not so much. So it just depends on what you want to put and what you need out of it. So let's jump over to the lab and we'll do a vShield tour. I'll show you the vShield components and I'll show you the vShield manager and a little bit about how they work. So here we are in the lab. Let's take a look at my host and clusters here. Let's see, I've deployed vShield app to Optimus here. And again, if you want to play around with these things, you can go and get evaluation licensing. So let me make sure that that's still running in eval mode. VShield app, edge, and endpoint are good to 425 there, so I'm all good. So here we are. Let's take a look. Optimus has that loaded. So we look at the configuration. We look at networking, not adapters. And you're going to see a little bit of an oddity here. This is your service VM, vShield Firewall FW Optimus Nash Lab Local. And it's hooked into a VM, a VM service, VMK NIC. So this is all internal. There's no physical adapters, nothing to worry about. If we look at VMs, he lives here. So if I deployed vShield app to all my hosts, each one is going to get a service VM. The management of those VMs is a lot easier here in vSphere 5. It understands those when you put a host in maintenance mode, shut them down, stuff like that. Whereas it used to be a little bit more of an issue, you know, uh, in the past. So something to not to worry about like we used to in the 401 days. So not a whole lot to see here. Everything else is done through the vShield Manager. And I'm running that right here. This is the vShield Manager. I deployed the OVA file, vShield Manager, VMware. I signed an IP address. We looked at console. Probably not going to be too exciting. It's basically a Linux console. If we want to look at the interface, we can go to Home and vShield. Again, you can do this through a browser or you can just use the plugin. Plugin is not going to do nothing but put the browser in a little window within vCenter. Give it a second to load. Say yes to the certificate. By default, the login is admin and default. And here's the pretty interface. So on the left, we've got our tree structure. If we look at Optimus here, and it'll say, it'll show me vShield app is installed. 
what version endpoint is installed. Data security is actually one I didn't mention yet. It's part, uh, it's new in five, and it's actually part of endpoint, and it's actually used for, you know, data protection kind of at rest. So if you're under, again, PCR HIPAA or something like that, you can actually monitor data and traffic flows for things like credit card numbers, social security numbers, stuff like that. With vSphere 5.0, it's very version one. It's not really monitoring things in real time as they go in and out. It's really data at rest, but that's going to become very interesting. Again, if you're under compliance for any reason and you want to make sure that, you know, certain VMs should never see credit card data, you'll be able to point that at them and anytime that comes in or out, it'll flag it, it'll stop it. It's going to become a very cool feature. So Optimus here has these two installed. He's got his service VM is his firewall VM right there. And if I click that button, I can see all sorts of information, throughput, stuff like that. Now, when I install this, I'll show you one right here. We'll take a look at Megatron. It's not installed. When I say I want to install app, I'll go ahead and at least start the install so you can see it. What it's going to ask for is some information, because remember, it has to install this service VM. It's going to say, what data store do you want me to put it on? What network port group for management do you want me to put it on? And give me an IP address and netmask and gateway that I can use. Endpoint doesn't have a service VM. When we install something like Trend's Deep Security, Trend installs a service VM and we'll give it similar information, but we don't do that here. Endpoint is just enabled for the host and a filter driver is installed, but that's it. For app, it is going to ask for this. So you need to give it an IP on this management network that is reachable for that system. So back to Optimus here real quick. Since Endpoint is enabled, I have an Endpoint tab. And it's just going to show me things like, here's the host, and I have one VM on there that I have protected just as a demo. So this is called ViewCon. It's a machine I was playing with on View Connection Server. And it says Thin Agent Enabled. So it used to be that you would install this small Thin Agent on every VM you wanted to protect with Endpoint. So again, if I want to use Trends Deep Security to protect that from malware, I had to install what we call a Filter Agent or a Thin Agent. Now, it's not something like an antivirus agent you had to keep updated. But now uh, VMware has rolled that into VMware Tools, so once Tools is installed, you're good to go. And it just shows you the key here is this console will be green if all the VMs are protected on the host and everything's good. If not, this is where you can come and see which VMs are being protected and which aren't and if they don't have that agent installed. But again, that's for endpoint. Come back over to summary. And if we want to look at the firewall rules, uh, we can look. Actually, let's look at one thing here. View con. Is there anything in my flow monitoring? I haven't done much. No. And you can come through here and look at all sorts of different information for flow gathering. But I don't have a lot. You can even go to specific NICs and look at that. You can look at summary information, which hosts are actually enabled for protection with vShield, which are not. We can look at app firewall. And here we'll have our rule sets, so layer 3 rules, layer 2 rules, high, low, network configurations, things like that. This will look a little different depending on your version of vShield. But to configure some of that, we can go to, say, networks. And we have different networks. So it knows I, I have VLAN 5 for management and VM, VLAN 7 for FTV motion, uh, 100 for my external. And here we can come in, we can look at flow monitoring for each of the different networks. I don't have much because I haven't deployed it everywhere. But we can do things with the app firewall. And here's where we can add rules. So we're looking at networks, which means we can add them to the network section. We'll add this rule. And we can do things like, you know, source, destination. Uh, you can do IP subnet range. You can do groups, predefined IP sets. Again, if this is vShield zones, you're limited to IP ranges. You can't do groups. Type of traffic, known protocol or known application or protocol. Here's your normal protocols there. You got applications there. If you click this, it's got a bunch of stuff that it knows about. Do you want to block it? Allow it. Log it. Don't log it. Enable it. Don't enable it. And notes for later so you can remember why you blocked a certain port. But again, you can go through each of these kind of different criteria and set your layer 2 and layer 3 rules. Layer 2 is a little different. 
again source destination protocol is ARP LLC x25 if you do that IP version 4 all that stuff you know just depends on what you want to do I don't do a lot of layer 2 rules hey, here's net buoy if you remember that but again block log and enable so you just come through here and you can create your firewall rules and they're applied. So they're applied across the entire environment that's enabled for vShield zones or app. That's what's cool about it. You know, you apply a rule, you set a rule one time, and across your entire VMware cluster, that rule is enforced, which makes it very simple. The other option here is port groups. And we can look at things which are basically, you know, data security, which again, I mentioned we're not doing here because we're not enabled for that, but it is an option. Settings and reports, they're real simple. When you install the uh, vShield manager, you have to point it to vCenter, give it a login and password. That's how it applied the plugin. That's how it created all the configurations. That's how it can talk to the host, you know, and make changes to vSphere. You just point it at your vCenter server. If you want to unregister this plugin for some reason, you click that, you can add it. Very important to have DNS, you know, vSphere and vCenter are very reliant on DNS, so you want to set that. Date, support, backups of the configuration, definitely want to do that. If you want to set up your own SSL certificates, any other networking information that you want to set. Spoof guard is an interesting feature. I don't see this actually implemented a lot, but if I hit edit, basically it will track IP assignments. So when a VM comes up, uh, you can say one of two things, automatically trust on their first use or manually inspect. So a lot of people will do automatically trust. What it means is, the VM boots up and you assign it the IP of, you know, whatever, 10, 10, 10, 14, it's going to keep that in a list. If one day that VM starts talking on 10, 10, 10, 18, it's going to block that traffic. So it's basically stopping your VMs from spoofing IP addresses. Again, it's an interesting feature. I don't see many people actually deploy this in production. If you want to update the manager, you do that here. If you want to create users and permissions, obviously here, and event and audit logs. So I'll be honest, it's not the best interface when you're in here as far as a management security tool, but it's not terrible once you figure out how to use it. There's also great API integration with the vShield suite. You can do a lot of cool automation things. I mean, that's how vCloud works. It talks to, v, to the vShield manager using those APIs and automates a lot of these things. But I think that's it for the quick tour of the vShield Manager and the operation. Just remember, it does deploy a VM, service VM. And if you're using something like Trend, you may have a vShield Zones service VM. And you may have a vShield Endpoint and Trend service VM. So you can end up with several service VMs you know, as you add different things. If you added another product that did some sort of intrusion protection, you know, Trend does that. But if you did a specific one for that, you can end up with several service VMs on your host. So those things have overhead, you know, and they are VMs and they count against your VRAM entitlement just like any other. You know, this guy's only a gig, so that's not bad. But he's two vCPUs and, you know, doesn't use much disk space. You know, provisioned is only five gig. But this stuff starts to add up over time. So kind of keep that in mind as you deploy these things. So with that, let's jump back to the slide deck. And then, of course, you know, we hit on a couple of third-party tools. There's a lot of them out there. This is a market that's growing. Trend Micro Deep Security is one that I have a lot of experience with. They initially, initially released their 7.5 version, which had, you know, integration with Endpoint. Now they have their version 8 product. Very good. It's getting better and better. Bitdefender is another one that has uh, released a product. Symantec has announced product. There's also Altor and Viata, which are other kind of firewall products. So some interesting stuff out there. You know, Cisco's Nexus 1000 vSwitch adds a lot of security features. We don't talk about the 1KV much except in comparison in this course, but it gives you access lists. You can do DHCP snooping and ARP inspection, which are popular in VDI environments, so you don't want anybody, you know, you know exploiting a VDI client and then try to leverage that for the rest of the network. You can integrate it with the virtual ASA firewall and the virtual security gateway, which is a multi-tenancy firewall and, and segmentation product. So there's a lot of other plugins for the 1KV that you can do above and beyond what you get in your standard vSwitch or distributed switch. But again, this is a market that is expanding greatly and changing very rapidly.
So that's it for this lesson. Uh, it was a it was a run through a lot of the security considerations for network design for deployment, especially around those kind of you know security limited environments like DMZ or HIPAA or PCI compliant networks. But we talked about you know security considerations with virtual networking, how it compares to physical networking, things you need to be concerned about. Talked a quickly about firewall ports. I point you to the KB article again. I don't want to get too specific on that because it changes with different versions and different options and different components. Keep that KB article handy when you configure your firewalls. Went over the three different options for network configuration for different trust zones, kind of the close to physical all the way into the totally collapsed with virtual everything option and gave you the pros and cons for each of those. Common security mistakes and considerations. These, you know, a lot of these I'll admit are best practices or not best practices, but common sense but also best practices and things to keep in mind. A lot of them, you know, things like don't trunk unnecessary VLANs or carry over from the physical networking world. But, it, you know, it's stuff that I see all the time, things that, that people don't really, you know, put into practice. Protecting management and other network, we talked about how fault tolerance, vMotion, NFS, iSCSI, standard management, a lot of that stuff is not encrypted. So you don't want an attacker to have access to that or they could get access to a lot more information. So usually you want to keep that to a separate physical network. Then we did a big run through the vShield suite. Uh, the point of that for, for me to you was to explain that, that suite and really go into the different components of it. You know, TrainSignal has a uh, vSphere security design course where we talk more in depth on some of these things. But again, you know, I want you to understand the four components of that suite, how they're used, what they're used for, and again, a lot of people get confused and, you know, don't understand the, really the application of those. So I wanted you to see that. And then a quick discussion on third-party tools. There's a lot of tools out there, and it's getting better and better. Uh, the market is expanding. Again, you know, I've got a lot of personal experience with Trends product. I've looked at Bitdefender. I've looked at Viata. I've looked at several of those. And it, it's really getting to the point that we can do what I call better than physical security in a virtual world because we can plug right into that hypervisor underneath that guest OS. We couldn't do that with physical. I mean, we couldn't plug in underneath that, you know, server hardware like we can here with the VM environment. So I think it's a great, a great place to be in the market. It's, it's definitely security is expanding and even more so in the virtual world. And that really gives you a good overview. So that's it for this lesson. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.